Great, thank you. Um, welcome, welcome to the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network or um, UNSDSN to our ESD webinar entitled Now or Never, Accelerating Transformative Education Through ESD in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand. My name is Karen, and I'm honored to be your host as we embark on a journey to explore the transformative power of Education for Sustainable Development, or ESD, in our region. Today, we will delve into the pressing issues that are shaping the future of education in Southeast Asia. Why is this conversation important now? ESD has been around for a long time, but especially since the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals, it has gained a lot of traction with UNESCO leading the way. And there is now a strong global movement of educators, policymakers, and stakeholders coming together to redefine the purpose of education and ensure that it serves as a catalyst for sustainable development and positive change. This is also evident in our region of ASEAN, where with the challenges posed by climate change, environmental degradation, social inequality, find the purpose um, of education, economic instability, there is an urgent need to re-examine our approach to education. We know that the systems we had were created for realities that are far different from what our children will face. And we therefore need to equip them with the knowledge, skills, and values to navigate this increasingly complex world. Today, we have an esteemed panel of experts practitioners and thought leaders who are at the forefront of the ESD movement in Southeast Asia. Together, we will explore innovative strategies, best practices, and success stories that are shaping the future of education and empowering learners to become agents of change in their communities and beyond. Allow me to briefly introduce our speakers today. So first up, we have from Indonesia, Dr. Iwan Sharil is the Director General of Early Childhood Education, Primary Education and Secondary Education at the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology in Indonesia. He has more than 27 years working as a practitioner, scholar and policymaker. In the past five years, he has been engaged in creating and implementing transformative policies for more than 300,000 schools and 3 million teachers and school leaders, inspiring them to be continuously engaged in learning about teaching so that they can reach, inspire and unleash the potential of every student. Next, we have Associate Professor Dr. Subarna Sivapalan, who is uh, head of the School of Education at the University of Nottingham in Malaysia. She has over 20 years of experience within the education sector. At the national level, Dr. Subarna is actively involved in sustainability education advocacy. She is presently the co-chair of the National Education for Sustainable Development Association of Selangor. She sat on the National Committee of WWF Malaysia's Foundation for Environmental Education or FEE, Eco Schools Program, and has held the role of chair and deputy chair of the FEE Eco Campus Program National Committee. At the international level, she is a fellow of Acumen, the World School for Social Change. She is also fellow of the UN University ProsperNet, Building Transformational Leadership Towards the SDGs. Dr. Subarna is also re recipient of WWF Malaysia's National Eco Lecturer Award for her efforts in advocating for greater awareness 
amongst youth to champion sustainability. She's also Senior Research Fellow at UNSDSN, working on Mission 4.7, as well as a member of the recently established Advisory Co Coalition for ESD in Malaysia under the purview of the Ministry of Education. Next, we have from the Philippines, Associate Professor Dominador Mangao, who is currently uh, Associate Professor at the College of Alternative and Lifelong Learning of the Philippine Normal University and former Deputy Dean of the College of Flexible Learning and EPNU at the same university. Prior to joining PNU, Dr. Mangao worked as Education Specialist for Science Education at Semio Regional Center for Education in Science and Mathematics, or REXAM, in Malaysia for more than 12 years, where he was actively engaged in training, research, and developing curricula. He was the project coordinator and co-author of the Semio Basic Education Standards, Common Core Regional Learning Standards in Mathematics and Science, Semio STEM Planning and Design Learning Framework Towards 21st Century Skills and Design Thinking. And he was chapter author of Integrating Climate Change Issues in Southeast Asian Schools, a Teacher's Guide. Dr. Mangao served the Philippines Department of Education Central Office before his stint with Semio Rexem. And finally, from Thailand, we have Dr. Fuang Arun Pri De Delok, who is Associate Professor of Development Education, Faculty of Education, Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. She has taught Education for Sustainable Development at Chulalongkorn University and other universities for almost 10 years. She has done research on more than 23 projects and published 33 papers. Papers relate to ESD include Guidelines to Develop Learning and Teaching, Education for Sustainable Development Courses. He wrote a chapter in Education and, and Sustainability, Paradigms, Policies and Practices in Asia, published by Routledge, and wrote a book entitled A Paradigm of Education for Sustainable Development. At the international level, she used to be a member of the ESD Teacher Education Institutions Network, operated by UNESCO SEMIO and Education for Sustainability Asia Network, operated by the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Now she's also on the advisory committee of Global Environmental Education Partnership, Asia Pacific Regional Center. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage each of you to actively participate in our conversation this morning, share your insights, and, I, and please do ask questions via the chat function. By engaging in dialogue and collaborative exchange, we can together envision a more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable future for education in Southeast Asia. Thank you again for joining us, and let's make today's conversation both enlightening and impactful. Without further ado, let's dive into our discussion today. So my first question is to all of you. It will be the same question posed to all of you. And um, that question is, could you please share the national mandate of your Ministry of Education in delivering ESD at scale? How does your ministry plan to implement this? I would like to start with you, Dr. Iwan. Thank you so much, uh, Karen. Um, thank you and good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so we adopted the uh, SDGs uh, in 2015, of course, like all UN members. Um, and I think it took a while for, for us to uh, think about what it means uh, in terms of education. Uh, in 2019 in particular, the president decided to um, hyper-focus on the human capital, um, uh, the development for our national development. And uh, we then uh, reflected on what had been done in the past, let's say 20 to 30 years. 
And we knew that uh, we found that we had made significant progress in terms of educational access, but in terms of the the impact of the uh, the the quality of the process and the the uh, the graduates uh, student outcomes, we were stagnant for uh, quite a, a long number of years. So then we decided uh, our problem definition was um, to solve the learning crisis. So uh, so students go to school, but then learning is question mark. So that is um, our um, main issue that we, we, we wanted to tackle head on. And then we decided that going forward, uh, in terms of human capital development, we needed to be more strategic. We uh, know that the future was very um, uncertain. Um, uh, disruption is the new normal. <laughs> it's, uh, it's happening all the time. So what kind of human capital that we need to uh, prepare for the future? And then the answer is lifelong learners. And I mean, this sounds uh, very cliche, but we really mean it in terms of we want to uh, make sure that uh, our future citizens and which will, will be global citizens um, can be engaged in learning all the time. So then they have to have a basic skills for uh, to be lifelong learners, which are literacy and numeracy and also we add character component into it so the hyper focus on literacy and numeracy was decided uh before the pandemic actually and then during the pandemic uh of course all countries suffered uh in terms of a setback in terms of reaching the sdgs uh learning loss uh, and then uh, all the studies after um the covid was uh, starting to be fading away uh, pointed to uh, the, the importance to focus on foundational skills. And I think we were kind of like, we already set our education system prior to that uh, on the path of focusing on the foundational skills. And uh, we we had like national assessment that we, um, uh, where we want to measure, uh, not every student, not like the high stake exam, but it's just like a census, um, a survey based, sorry, a survey based national assessment on literacy and numeracy. So um, this is um, what we plan to do going forward, because um, all the, the other SDGs, uh, 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 of course, SDG 4 is about education, but the other SDGs, are dependent on the quality of our human resources uh, to deliver uh, and all the national and then also the local government level. So uh, this is something that we believe is super important. And uh, I think now in 2024, after about five years uh, from 2019, we made some good progress on this uh, based on our national assessment and also uh, the, the, the latest uh, PISA results uh, were uh, it showed how the education system um, were impacted during the COVID. And I think our uh, resist, our resilience was uh, proven uh, with that assessment. And I think um, our national planning uh, ministry, uh, national development planning ministry, they uh, already put the, the next 25 years of planning, actually go beyond 2030, um, uh, to focus on this uh, trajectory. So... Hopefully, this will um, accelerate, uh, of course, uh, recover from the learning loss and also pick up the pace that we had before and then accelerate towards uh, achieving the sustainable development goals uh, in Indonesia and also hopefully impacting the, the ecosystem around the globe. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Iwan. Um, I, I fully agree with you that lifelong learning is, is of paramount importance and um, also, the point that you raised, which which I think is really spot on, that SDG four is on quality education, but it's really the SDG that enables all the other SDGs to be achieved. I think that that's a powerful um, point, and uh, it's really wonderful to hear of the the great um, efforts that the Indonesian government is making to enable this, and it's not easy given how big the country is and how large the population of students are. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to turn um, the question over now to Dr. Subarna. Uh, could you tell us about the Ministry of Education in Malaysia's mandate? Thank you, Karen. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here on this panel with such esteemed speakers. 
um and uh you know this is a learning process for me as well today so i'm looking forward to uh, understanding what colleagues in you know uh, indonesia uh, thailand and the philippines are all doing because i think there is so much scope for us to work together within this region um so back to your question yeah uh, on um you know what's the national mandate by the ministry of education in malaysia here in delivering esd in scale i think um you know esd is something that the ministry looks into very very seriously here right it may not be spelled out very explicitly as esd but as shown in the country profiles just now yeah for malaysia uh we have the education blueprint right we have two blueprints in fact uh for preschool to post secondary and also the higher education blueprint uh both are coming to an end next year 2025 so it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to be happening beyond 2025 so in these two blueprints at both uh, both levels um there are there are many instances in which you know um sustainability at large as well as esd is incorporated but if you ask me if this incorporation is enough the answer would definitely be no we can do much much more right um and just a little bit of background yeah um to look into how much the ministry has been supportive uh, and is continuing to support sustainability education is the fact that we've had more than 300 schools uh, this is based on 2021 data karen uh we have more than 300 eco schools uh and more than 1000 scola lestari or sustainable schools so these are uh, initiatives the ministry has been uh working towards um and i want to mention the eco schools in particular uh because this program you know is uh, run by the foundation for environmental education or fee as you mentioned earlier um and uh, coordinated at the local level by wwf malaysia for about 10 years and then uh, i think it was last year or the year before it's taken over by green growth asia foundation So we have these kinds of programs that are running on the ground to complement what the education ministry is doing. So definitely I would say that there's a lot going on uh but we can do much better yeah. Um and as I mentioned earlier the blueprints are coming to an end in 2025. So what's going to happen next? So um I've been quite fortunate uh you know to be engaged by uh, ministry of education to sit on uh, meetings to go for stakeholder engagement sessions and all and uh, we are coming to a curriculum review in 2027 so two years down the road yeah uh, so if there are uh, participants from malaysia who are here in the call today you know uh, some interesting things for us to look forward to um you know in our education system coming along the next few years so in these sessions you know that i've attended there is a clear direction uh, the ministry has said in terms of wanting more embedding or wanting more integration of sustainability within the curriculum at the primary school and secondary school levels uh, also integration of sdgs within the curriculum so uh, you know we are having lots of stakeholder engagement sessions we are gathering feedback from all the multiple levels of stakeholders that we have so we are hoping that you know uh, we are hoping to see something really interesting coming out you know in the new uh, curriculum that's going to be out in 2027 yeah um and um at this point you know maybe i want to mention about the connect between primary and secondary school and higher education because students from you know secondary school they're going to be moving they're going to be moving into the higher education system in malaysia and what's happening in higher education system in malaysia is that uh we have you know universities offer many different kinds of academic programs and within all these different kinds of academic programs maybe i can just bring out an example of engineering education for yeah so engineering is a program that has a very clear mandate for its graduates to have sustainability literacies and sustainability competences because these are skills that are necessary for them to be able to function as proper engineers when they go out from the from the, uh, you know from the from the institution and these are these are requirements by the you know accreditation boards professional bodies and so on and so forth 
But there are other programs as well. There are other academic programs as well within universities. Uh, but maybe there isn't enough emphasis for sustainability and ESD within these programs. So I think if we are making adjustments, you know, to accommodate this at primary and secondary school, we should be doing the same uh, for uh, higher education as well. Um, so not to not to say that we, we are not doing it, we are, but I think we can do this in a more sustainable way uh, and also looking at looking at the ecosystem as a whole, looking at this as a very systemic, uh, looking at this from a very systemic uh, um, perspective. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the shot of it, Karen. Thank you, Subarna. Um, yes, uh, I, I totally agree in Malaysia within policies, ESD is not stated explicitly, but it is implied and um, I, I'd also agree with you that although it is incorporated, there's a lot more room for improvement. Um, I'm happy to work with you on this national ESD coalition for ES, uh, for, for the country as well. Um, and uh, looking forward to a meaningful journey for Malaysia uh, and also agree about, you know, the entire value chain has to be in place. So K-12 to needs to then extend to higher education and then as Dr. Iwan said earlier, lifelong learning as well for professionals to keep uh, upskilling and reskilling ourselves. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'd like to turn the question now over to Dr. Dominador um, to share uh, the perspectives from the Philippines. Thank you very much, Ms. Karen. Uh, magandang umaga po. Salamat pagi. Uh, a very good morning. So, um, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Eman for uh, the invitation uh, to, to share the Philippine uh, experience uh, and practices on ESD. Uh, so though I've been away for 12 years from the Department of Education in the Philippines, but having served um, the department for almost uh, 20 years no, before moving to Ragsam. Uh, I, I still am connected because we have uh, a lot of projects um, with the CMU member countries and Ragsam. So I would just like to share to you the chronological events somehow no, in the um, implementation of ESD, no, though it's not explicit in the documents, but um, right away, uh, uh, four years after the uh, Agenda 21 uh, in Rio de Janeiro, uh, the Philippines already had um, the Philippine agenda uh, for as the blueprint of what um, sustainable development would be like. And then this was followed by different clause no, as mandate to really implement the sustainable development, such as um, Republic Act 9512 or the National Environment Awareness and Education Act of 2008. So this uh, mandates that um, to integrate education, I mean, environmental education to um, all the curricula, no, formal, non-formal, and even from preschool, no, even out of school youth and indigenous learning. Then in 2009, the establishment of Southeast Asia Center for Lifelong Learning for SD in the Philippines. And then uh, 13 years after that, in 2009, we have the Enhanced Philippine Agenda, or EPA 21. So this, um, uh, the direction of this is really to uh, intensify the promotion of SD lifestyle and responsible citizenship, uh, develop um, uh, curriculum for integrating uh, ESD and SD and identify entry points for mainstreaming of SD principles such as climate change, environmental education, disaster uh, reduction. Uh. And so these modules, um, how to be used no? 
in uh, all levels of education and then uh, try out some um, innovative and non-traditional learning modes uh, that will enhance and uh, expose um, SD issues uh, and integration. Then in um, we have also the Climate Change Act of 2009 the mainstreaming of climate change in basic education. Then another one, the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction Management of 2010. Uh, this again mandates now all um, secondary and tertiary education, public and private, to um, integrate the RR education in the school curricula. And then that led to the development of modules, lesson exemplars, resource materials you know, for uh, both teachers and students to use. And then, um, uh, of course, um, in 2013, reiterating the school disaster risk reduction measures. In 2015, the comprehensive um, DRR and management basic education framework. In 2019, the inclusion of the um, uh, RR in grades 11 and 12, na, in the K to 12, and in 2020, na, so we have developed the basic education development plan. Na? So that's 2020 to 2030, wherein um, it is uh, anchored on um, three uh, education na uh, sulong edukalidad. Uh, Philippine Development Plan and uh, SDG 2030. Um, so uh, I guess uh, uh, these are the legal basis and how no, uh, we are implementing various um, um, capacity building curriculum no, to really propel uh, ESD in the Ministry of Education. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dom. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I take note that there are many, many acts and policies that you have listed uh, that the country has adopted. Um, I think this would be interesting that when we discuss the next question about uh, challenges when it comes to implementing these, because uh, I, I believe this is pretty universal in many countries. We have beautiful policies, documents, <laughs> acts, um, and implementation becomes a challenge. So we'll, we'll exactly. come back to that. Um, <laughs> let me turn yeah. now to to our speaker from Thailand, Dr. Phuong Arun, if you can tell us about the Thai government's mandates. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, Sabadika is my turn from Thailand. So I have uh, some picture that is uh, easy to understand. This is a uh, basic education of Thailand. This is the age of student, uh, 7 to uh, 13 to uh, 7 to 13 or 17 uh, that uh, study in the basic education. Uh, in the basic education uh, of Thailand, is follow the basic education co uh, co curriculum uh, 2008. In the basic education co curriculum, there are eight learning areas, uh, Thai language, mathematics, science, and social study, religion, and culture, and to the foreign language. Uh, in today, I will give uh, really a few uh, examples of the uh, indicator in the learning area that relate to ESD. Uh, not only the basic education curriculum that cover uh, three dimensions of uh, sustainability, uh, uh, economic, social, and environmental. Uh, okay. This is an example of the, the curriculum in the, uh, in the stand geography. In the stand geography, that is a standard. The standard of the student is that the student to understand of in internship between uh, man and physical environment, leading to cultural creativity, awareness, and uh, participation in conservation of, of resources and the environment for sustainable development. Uh, this is an ex example of the indicator for students in grade one to grade six. Uh, for the basic education in Thailand, we have a grade one 
uh, to great travel. This is only one example. Uh, for this uh, geography, for great one, number three, I'm, I'm not sure the picture is clear or not. Uh, participant in organizing environmental order at home and in the classroom. You see, but for the student in grade one, it's an uh, easy thing, simple thing that student uh, can learn. And uh, when uh, grade, uh, grade two is more, is more harder, uh, participate in uh, relation, uh, I, I'm not, <laughs> uh, okay. And improving the environment in school and in the community is mean that for education for the student in Thailand, not only in their home or school, but must connect to the uh, community that they stay. And for grade three, uh, be aware of the environmental change in the community is harder. And uh, to the grade uh, six, prepare a plan for utilizing natural resources in the community. And if you uh, see the indicator, you, you can see the curriculum uh, on the website. It's easy to search and you will see the indicator of every uh, learning area and every uh, level of the student. For the ESD integration element uh, uh, for Thailand, uh, we concerned about the three dimension that I mentioned before and the content, uh, uh, the teacher must uh, adjust stood for the student uh, in their context. The method of uh, teaching, uh, not only lecture, maybe the activity in the community, uh, maybe the, the uh, project-based learning. And also the curriculum, even we have the core curriculum, but uh, teacher can adjust the curriculum that suit for the student in the province or in the community. The institution and policy that we have a policy, national policy, and community. Uh, back to the first picture is the not only the core curriculum, but we also have the uh, two project eco school. Eco school is uh, responsible uh, for the Ministry of Natural Resources of Thailand, and EESD school is uh, responsible uh, for the. Um, the Ministry of Education, both uh, uh, like a, run the project in in the same direction, such as the uh, the student project competition, a teacher workshop and training, and uh, also in the web uh, on the website have a learning resource for the uh, student, for the teacher, even more the the people uh, in in the country that can learn about the the ESD uh, in. Uh, uh, all the dimension, economic and society and environment. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fong Arun. Uh, it's really, really encouraging to see such um, enlightened views coming out of uh, how Thailand is, is transforming its education system. Um, I'd like to move on to the second question now. Um, and uh, again, I would ask a similar question to all of you. Um, and this one really is the one where it, it, it appeals to giving us your own insight, given the experiences that you have had. So Dr. Iwan, I'd like to turn the attention back to you now. Um, Indonesia is such a big country and to, to transform education is, Certainly not easy, uh, especially for a country of the size of Indonesia. So could you tell us from your perspective, what are the biggest challenges in transforming education in Indonesia? And um, if we have time, I, I would like to ask all our panelists to keep your comments fairly short. Uh, what do you think is the role of partnerships in overcoming these challenges? Okay, um, well, you already mentioned that one of the biggest challenges is just uh, the sheer number uh, the of the population. Um, uh, at the moment, we have about 50 million students uh, and they, they study in uh, more than 300,000 uh, schools, uh, more than 3 million teachers, uh, but not just about size, by the way, but also the geographical uh, challenges. They are spread in this um, 17,000 islands. So a city in Indonesia can be can consist of 
30 something islands. <laughs> it's like a city, right? So if you can imagine about the the logistic and also the, the how the transportation um, to make a connection among teachers within that city or for the local government is is not a, an easy thing. Um, and also, uh, what is often forgotten, and I think I I, I came to this uh, realization uh, much more. Uh, I think um, uh, this is uh, something as a scholar I I knew, but uh, never really registered in my mind how difficult it is, which is about governance. Indonesia has 552 autonomous local governments. So uh, they have the authority about how to use the budget, how to plan their education, um, and they can uh, deviate from the national uh, trajectory, national policy. So to be able to uh, engage and do advocation, advocacy to these local governments is another um, I think is actually the fundamental challenge in our governance uh, in general, in, in education. You can imagine like, you know, like if I come to each local government to talk about um, their aspiration and, and so on with the, the head of the local government, one year is not enough because one year only has 365 days. And this is uh, 552. So and working days, only 250 working days, uh, if we take out the holidays. So two years is not enough uh, just to visit one uh, local government. That is the, the challenge that we that we have to face, that we have to deal with in terms of uh, uh, um, managing the education ecosystem, let alone transforming. Because when you talk about transform, you talk about change. And change is disruptive. Change is moving from the current status quo change is moving to a different paradigm. And that is actually the, the biggest, uh, well, it, it is the, the, the biggest um, fundamental thing that we can, we can, uh, we can have for uh, what we can do later on uh, more meaningfully, but that's the, also the most difficult part to do. Um, but, uh, and the other part is actually mindset. I mentioned about the paradigm. I think in any education system, big or small, changing mindset is the, the biggest uh, achievement of 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 us uh, in trying to to do that, but it's also the most difficult part, and also is happening in Indonesia. So, what? How do we do that? And you mentioned about partnership. So, I think uh, the ministry, uh, the minister, uh, uh, I had this conversation early uh, in two thousand nineteen with him. So, how do we deal with this very complex ecosystem? And he said, we we need to find the hack. <laughs> so. We have to think with no box, not only outside of the box, but with no box. So how we can think to problem solve this okay, the learning crisis, we want to problem solve that, but also understanding the context we are situated in. First of course, is technology, but what about investing in human capital within the ecosystem, especially then we turn to leadership, uh, the new generation of leadership. And this is where I think uh, we have um, made the uh, uh, breakthrough um, because we invest in these change, leader, uh, change leaders, change agents within the ecosystem in each local government. So um, we have a new kind of training for to become school leaders. And this new training really transform, or like the assessment to be in is intrinsically. So they need to be self-motivated to to come to this training, a leadership training program. Uh, we understand intrinsic motivation is actually the most powerful uh, factor in meaningful learning for uh, teachers, not when they are assigned by the local, their own local government to come to this training. No, we want to be open, all teachers can apply and then they become uh, the change uh, agents and they, they we make them to become uh, school leaders and school supervisors. And we have seen this uh, in our um, pockets of uh, ecosystem start to, to change and to move forward. And these change agents, they, with the new mindset, they uh, uh, start the, the their action without waiting for the instruction they have this mindset of problem solving within their limitations. It's asset-based thinking mindset. It's not deficit-based thinking. It's not like, oh, we don't have this, we don't have that. So what can government do for us? But they, they start to think about, okay, we, we don't have this, but we have this. So how can we make the most of this to, to then reach our students and then to uh, facilitate the kind of learning that we want them to have? Uh, despite all of these challenges and limitations. So with this new mindset, these 
change agents and inspire other educators around them. And when they become school leaders, they have the authority, uh, school as the unit of change to do a lot of like innovation, professional learning community. We talk about partnership. We actually experiment, uh, we are experimenting with uh, a professional learning community, uh, maybe one of the, the, the biggest experiment at the moment in the world uh, within the schools. Uh, there's PLC in the school and PLC also uh, in their community and also PLC online. So I think um, uh, we invite all stakeholders, uh, um, development partners, uh, either the uh, the universities or um, uh, NGOs, uh, foundations, uh, international organizations, uh, to work together, to problem solve together with these uh, change agents. But the most important thing when you do the partnership, it must be super, super clear. What is the purpose? Because when the purpose is not clear, the partnership can go scattered to many different directions. And the purpose for us is uh, for us is for our students and especially on the foundational skills and the character development. So that is like the 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 big the, the compass of this movement in, within the ecosystem. So it's not just the government uh, implementation of policy, but there's a sense of movement, movement that we're in this together, but with the clarity of purpose and leaders need to over communicate this. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, maybe again, like it's cliche in a lot of like leadership uh, books uh, that this needs to be done, but I cannot uh, state it enough that this is super, super important to have a clear purpose and to over communicate the purpose, even though you are bored of saying that. But I think within the ecosystem, it is very important. And I think from the communication science, uh, uh, any important information is registered to someone's mind after you, you talk about it for five times. <laughs> so, so you need to uh, really, really have this uh, clarity of purpose over communicated in the partnership. So then all stakeholders understand what to do and how they uh, can contribute to the problem solving. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Doctor. I think it, it's so powerful what you have said, and I couldn't agree with you more on the point, firstly, about how, um, you know, it has to be an intrinsic motivation to, to create change. And this thing about mobilizing the community in partnership, it's because, I mean, we, we all care about, about education. You know, it's a topic that's that affects every single person. Um, and uh, really admirable. I think Malaysia and other countries have so much to learn from Indonesia. Um, and, and speaking of Malaysia, let me turn now to Dr. Subarna. So we are a much smaller country in comparison to Indonesia. Uh, so, you know, that kind of puts things in perspective, I think, for us. Um, so what what do you think, Doctor, are our biggest challenges in transforming our education system and, and what you see is the role of partnerships here? Thank you, Karen. Uh, I want to first say I agree with everything Dr. Iwan mentioned just now because I think uh, there are very uh, generic issues uh, across all the countries. I think later we will also hear from the Philippines and Thailand. Uh, to me, personally, I think partnerships are very, very important. Um, and in Malaysia, I think we have got lots of good efforts going on with partnerships to transform education. Uh, before I go into these, uh, what, what I think are the potential benefits, I think I want to first talk about what transformative education is. Because Dr. Iwan spoke about the governance bit, which I think is very, very important. But along governance, we also need to be thinking about how we want to approach this transformation for education that we want, that we seek. So in ESD, those of us in ESD, all of us here today, I think uh, will probably recognize this term transformative learning or transformative education. Uh, and from an ESD lens, what it means is we want to transform uh, the head, the heart, and the hands, right? The, the head, heart, hands approach. So we want education to be uh, holistic in that sense. But I think this is what we need to be thinking about seriously. Are, are our education ecosystems in our countries doing this? So if we want to transform education as a whole, we need to be looking at the education per se as well, yeah? 
And uh, we've got great examples of partnerships here in Malaysia, Karen. Uh, one of it is the work that we are doing with SDSN uh, in Malaysia. Uh, I think I'll talk about this, you know, uh, in more detail when we have the uh, upcoming questions. But I think um, in, sense, in the sense of what benefits partnerships can bring, I think, you know, I've got a long list here, but maybe I'll just take up some key points here. So I think the first one is, you can't expect Ministry of Education to do everything on their own, right? Uh, that's not sustainable, right? Uh, we, we, we cannot leave the burden solely to Ministry of Education. So this is where I think partnerships can come into the picture. Um, so I want to cite the National ESD Coalition that we've been working towards in Malaysia. Yeah. So this coalition is an example of a partnership that is transcending just the Ministry of Education, but also going uh, into other key stakeholders of the education ecosystem here. So we've got universities uh, on board. We have got uh, civil society organizations on board. We've got SDSN on board. And we're all coming together for one clear purpose, that is to see how we can advocate for sustainability, for climate change education, uh, and for ESD uh, at the local level. So when we have partnerships like this, you know, everyone within the ecosystem benefits, in fact. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you have multi-dimensional perspectives. And those who benefit most, I think, would be the teachers and the students who are able to then, you know, get maximum or able to maximize the uh, benefits that these kinds of partnerships bring along. And I think another very important aspect is the fact that partnerships like this bring additional resources, uh, additional funding, additional manpower that, you know, uh, can assist ministry in running uh, programs on the ground. Um, besides that, I think, you know, partnerships like this give teachers and students an opportunity to experience real world learning. Um, some things, you know, cannot be done solely in the classroom. We want to experience this hands on, get our hands dirty, go down to the ground and basically uh, transfer what we learned in the classroom into real life action. So these are the things that partnerships can, can actually um, help us do, I think. So if you ask me, is it important? Extremely important. Are we doing this enough? No, we should be doing more of this. Thank you, Dr. Subarna. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm just very conscious that Dr. Iwan will have to leave us in 10 minutes. So I beg your indulgence, please, if I direct the next question to him. Um, and also it was a, a similar question has come out in the chat. So my question uh, to you next, Dr. Iwan, is regarding the Merdeka Balaja program or em emancipated learning. Um, you know, this is something that the whole world is talking about, looking towards Indonesia, and it has made some amazing strides with this Merdeka Balaja program uh, introduced by Minister Makarim. Could you please tell us how this program was made implementable across such a wide geographical area, um, and what are the key action that other countries can learn from? Well, um, basically, Merdeka Belajar is a commitment to um, yeah, for an education system to emancipate um, the potentials of uh, unleash the potential of every student, uh, emancipating all the stakeholders to innovate and to create what is best in terms of uh, growing the children to be the best version of they can be. So it's not like, uh, this is like the opposite of the philosophy to standardize everything uh, because we believe that uh, each a child is unique and each uh, field uh, is uh, also important for the developing uh, human civilization. In other words, that um, there's no like a, a you know favorite favorite area, favorite subjects, you know, but uh, all subjects are equally important. 
and all fields are equally important. So, and the other part of emancipated learning is to ensure that um, students um, have, and also the teachers and educators, uh, including in the university, have the opportunity to use the real experience uh, in the in the in the in the real world. So it's not just about uh, in the classroom, in the school, or in the university. So, for instance, in our there's a question about the curriculum, and I'd like to ref, uh, to uh, respond to that also within this uh, your question. The emancipated curriculum or curriculum merdeka uh, has like three main uh, features that I want to highlight. The first one. Uh, it's much more simple than the previous curriculum. So it's about 30 to 40% reduction of the previous curriculum. And this is not easy to do. It's a lot, it was a lot of debate. But then it allows for That's deep true. learning for our um, uh, students and also uh, give the license for our teachers to do deeper learning, not to uh, raise for more content, more content, and more content. Because when everything is important, so there is no, 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 no there's not, nothing that's important, right? Um, so uh, then it it also the second part is to give teachers the flexibility to teach at the right level. Uh, so if the students are still behind, uh, the teachers can uh, is it it's okay for the teachers to adjust their teaching to reach where the students are instead of keep teaching according to that level and blame the students and their parents for not. <laughs> Uh, making sure the child is at the right level. So uh, again, it's uh, it seems very simple, but uh, in, in the implementation, especially in the past, it was counterintuitive to do this. And now suddenly we give the uh, the license for teachers to be flexible. By flexible, we mean reach your for your students teach at the right level. And the third part that uh, component that I'd like to highlight is um, it is more relevant in terms that. Now that we have reduction in terms of the um, the content of 30 to 40 percent flexibility for the teachers to teach at the right level and also look at their students more uh, uh, more closely. And the third part is how to make the lessons more relevant. And here we have project based learning. The project based learning is about 20 to 25 percent of the curriculum component. What happens in the project based learning and the K-12 level is teachers from all subjects all subjects, not only within their subject or, or on the field, all subjects decide to come together, collaborate, create like a like a lesson or a unit of project together and engage all the students for something that is relevant within their community. So uh, let's say the in terms of educational sustainability, there is a topic about uh, tolerance. There's a topic about a sustainable living. Um, I was in Papua uh, a few months ago, and this is a very. You look at the school. This is one of the maybe the poorest schools in the in the, in that uh, community. Not all, Papua is already uh, not a, a, it's a least developed area in Indonesia. Uh, but then for that kind of community, this school that I visited was already one of the poorest ones. Uh, a private school. Uh, the 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 parents wouldn't want to send their children here uh, to this school. Uh, but if they are rejected from uh, to be accepted in other schools, they, they have no choice. So this is the school where they put their children, right? Um, and then they decided to use curriculum merdeka, the, the emancipated curriculum. And what happened was um, the students that are before labeled maybe as um, maybe naughty or troublemakers and et cetera, suddenly got engaged because they felt that their learning becomes more interesting because it was something connected with their community. So what happened was, uh, they're, they're, they, when they did a project, then again, like project-based learning for us is like working um, wonderfully. Of course, a lot of challenges, but um, it's a lot of these kind of stories. Um, they look at their community, and the problem was uh, the community uh, couldn't get clean water. That simple. They couldn't. They couldn't uh, get clean water in their uh, community. So then. These students, uh, by the way, this is junior uh, high school students. Um, they they try to think about how can we help their community to problem solve in terms of clean water. So they created uh, a lot of prototype of water filter, and in the end, they created this product of water filter that was uh, good uh, enough for the community, and the community decided to use it, use the product of these junior high school students 
and and this uh, student suddenly got engaged into like the science and they uh, and then again they wanted to learn more about science uh, and the community also wanted to wait for the next project that these uh, students uh, want to create so there was this kind of like learning becomes meaningful and this is what we want to see more in this new curriculum and in terms of university students um maybe you you have heard of this that uh, our emancipated learning uh, policy allows students to, to study. And this is, sounds maybe very um, revolutionary for, for even for us, three semesters to study outside their major. Three semesters and be counted as part of their program. So it's not like they're taking time away, but they are given credits, automatic credits. If they, let's say they, they study, um, they're in economics, they want to study design. They, um, they study, you know, uh, architecture and they want to work in a village uh, for one semester or two semesters uh, to help uh, maybe a NGO in terms of uh, solving the problems in this uh, village of, I don't know, maybe water or um, energy, and etc. And that, that experience, because we believe that the the, the human capital for the future needs to be given the situation when they need to problem solve, collaborate. Collaborate is just like simple work and everyone is like, it's very catchy phrase. It's so difficult to do as we know. And they learn about how to negotiate. What happens when there is a conflict? What happens when I need to talk to this kind of person? What happens when I need to set up a meeting? <laughs> what happens when I need to... It, it, it's all of these little things that we think that students should know when they graduate, but they did, they do, do not learn that actually from being just in the classroom in campus. And then automatically these are given credits. So it's not like they're taking a time, like a leave from campus for one or two semesters. That happened in the past, but making this part of their program. And of course there is a lot of resistance uh, at the beginning, but now it's become a norm. We have a one more than 1 million students that participated in this, uh, university students participated in this program. 100,000 uh, students of, of this uh, group uh, uh, chose to uh, become um, teacher assistants in the lowest performing schools, um, meaning the schools that have problems with uh, literacy below the minimum competency, numeracy. And then we give them training to help them to um, uh, help the teachers um, and the and then to teach the students there. And we already show the the impact of this uh, university students become the the tutors uh, in the lowest uh, performing schools. So they also help problem solve um, the, um, the 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 problem of learning crisis in Indonesia. And again, we don't we 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 don't create this as like an additional program, but this is included part of the program. So how we define learning, I think, in emancipated learning is uh, is also transform, um, and uh, and as you know, transformation uh, is not easy because it disrupts the status quo. Uh, the journey of change uh, in Indonesia, I think, uh, me personally, I think I um, it maybe validates what I learned in the university. Change is emotional. <laughs> Change is never something that is cognitive. Change is uh, uh, emotional. Uh, there is a cognitive dissonance and also a, a feeling of unease when we want to change. Um, and, and for us now trying to transform this, having, of course, with the clear purpose for the future um, and engaging in the implement, implementing at this uh, scale, uh, it's not easy at all. Um, but I think with the spirit of that partnership that you mentioned earlier, Karen, uh, we have the our local wisdom called Gotong Royong, uh, which is basically a, a sense of solidarity and social empathy that uh, even though that's not a problem directly to me, but uh, I, I, I feel that this is our collective problem. So let's do a collective action towards that. This Gotong Royong spirit, especially during COVID, I have to say, uh, was really helping us a lot. And I think it's, it's, it's um, getting more and more um, so it's getting stronger uh, going forward now. Um, so I think um, the emancipated um, learning or Merdeka Belajar uh, for really, you know, again, in a summary, based on like the, how we see the students and try to redefine what learning is, both, both in K-12 and also university, 
allowing to uh, have new ideas, uh, disrupting the uh, uh, previously uh, the previous ecosystem structure, but then with a clear mind, we're then not just disrupting this for being <laughs> disruptive, but we are disrupting this with the purpose of we need to move forward. What had been working in the past was not good enough. We need to try and brave uh, to be risk tolerant, uh, to um, try new ideas. Um, and uh, we're moving this understanding that, um, you know, the, the, the normal curve. Uh, so we've got the early adopters, the 20% at the beginning. Uh, and that's the story of change. And when 20% has already changed, this is the tipping point. Uh, the 80% is still not there yet. It's okay. So we understand this is a journey. Uh, and then we hope that uh, more and more late adopters and, uh, well, according to the theory, the diffusion of innovation, <laughs> it's like a snowball effect. So when we got a tipping point, uh, it will be um, uh, easier for us to, uh, going forward. Um, so that's um, how we think that we can accelerate towards achieving SDG by investing in our uh, human capital and also when they're learning in the school. School is not preparing them for what happened in the future, but the school itself is already engaging them with what is going to be. So it's not, that education is not a preparation of life, but education is a life in itself, says John Dewey. So we are actually uh, trying to do that. Uh, we have a lot of homework um, uh, to, to make this better, um, but uh, we know we are on the right track, uh, hopefully uh, also. We learn from uh, all the ecosystem around the world. Um, and thank you so much uh, for Dr. Subarna, Dr. Domidor, Dr. Fang, Ra uh, Fang, Fang, Ra Fang Arun um, for this opportunity, Karen. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, I am I'm very uh, honored to be here today. And hopefully uh, together we can reach the SDG because SDG is actually a framework for us, for a collective action, for global uh, citizens. Uh, this is not just about for each country and we share this planet, we share this global village. Uh, what is happening in our ecosystem is impacting the rest and also we can help each other too. So hopefully we can, uh, you know, move that with a spirit of partnership and solidarity. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. That was absolutely inspirational. So much for other countries to learn from. I have no doubt that um, in the near future, we'll be reading books about Indonesia's story and transforming its education. Uh, one powerful thing that I, I just want to recap uh, as a takeaway from what you said is how when students are engaged, when the learning is related to their lived realities, yeah. it makes a huge difference. Um, it engages them, they perform so much better and um, they are really, like you say, you know, education is, is what you're living through right now. It's not in preparation for something to come. And it's giving them that practice to be, to be change makers and problem solvers starting from now. So imagine how much practice they would have had when they, when they finish school and they're, they're building their careers. So thank you for inspiring us. Uh, we'll be following Indonesia's story closely and hope to have the opportunity to meet you again, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm very sorry that I have to leave uh, because of uh, there's another urgent agenda, but uh, good luck to us all uh, and hope we can stay in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, I'd like to now go back to um, Dr. Dom. Uh, sorry, uh, back to the question about challenges. Yeah, so um, in the Philippines, uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges when it comes to transforming education? Earlier, you had mentioned the, the many, many beautiful policies and acts and documents that have been prepared to enable this. But um, what do you see are as the biggest challenges and what is the role of partnerships in overcoming these? Thank you very much. You know, I don't know where to start because <laughs> when we talk about problems and challenges, we have a long list. <laughs> um, of course, geographically speaking, now we we share same um, challenge. You know, uh, um, we, though we have just a smaller island, seven thousand, and uh, that would already pose you know, some challenges, especially you know, in monitoring. Um, 
quality of education. Uh, but some more thoughts. So, of course, uh, as a teacher or whatever position you are, we are always with um, faced with perennial problems, na? lack of um, shortage in the classroom, lack of textbook, um, um, teacher quality, uh, lack of student interest, and uh, um, of course, uh, uh, lack of budget, and, <laughs> and um, the interference of politics. Na? <laughs> Forgive me, but um, you know, no, um, K to twelve. You know, we I think we were the the last country in Simio to have the K to twelve curriculum, no, and that uh, only implemented in twenty twelve. And now there's a clamor that we have to revert back to what what is it back K to ten. So there are moves from. The, the politics side from other stakeholders. So, and other big issue now, of course, is the, uh, the clamor no, because of the heat wave and the extreme temperatures to move back the school calendar to from June to March uh, classes. So that's a big headache now of the uh, education um, officers, how to abruptly uh, move the school calendar. Uh, um that's the call of all the politicians uh, um, revert abruptly <laughs> or else <laughs> oh my god so um, but anyhow so um, poor quality somehow on the base of international assessment we could deny it no? uh, teams and pisa would show um philippine students that not perform poorly uh, does not perform well no uh, bleak dismal but it's ironic at times when there are individual competitions filipino students excel no? but anyhow okay um we have uh the former uh, secretary uh dr uh, leonor briones who is now the director of uh, simu inotech and we have our very own vice president of the philippines now secretary uh sara duterte no? who is um uh, maneuvering the Department of Education, and no, um, we he is really uh, responding immediately. No, so okay, since there's a, there's a clamor of the K to twelve, let's revisit. So that's why we are now um, revising. We have uh, published the K to twelve curriculum. So then the the junior and the senior high school will follow, but now. Uh, what we call we have the matatag curriculum you no know, by uh, the famous uh, project started in um, just last year of uh, uh, vice president sara when we say matatag actually that is making the curriculum relevant to produce job ready active and responsible citizens ta means to take steps to accelerate delivery of basic education facilities and services another ta is take good care of learners by promoting learner well-being inclusive education and a positive learning environment and g in the matatag means giving support to teachers you know, for them to teach better so there are a lot of uh, changes happening going on um we are developing learning uh, packages uh, to go uh, with the matatag curriculum, the K-12. to So we are developing lesson exemplars to be provided to teachers and worksheets for students, grade 4 to grade 10. We are already implementing to 35 schools now, but grade 4 and grade 7 only. And then hopefully next year, we are... We have finished, we will have finished developing all the modules. So uh, all the faculties, um, the tertiary education, public and private, were uh, contacted. Those who are good writers, please help DepEd come up with um, uh, lesson plans and uh, worksheets for the students. Okay, and of course, um, uh, the the one uh, clamor is the mismatch no, of the senior high school students and the needs of the industry. 
So, of course, that is where the partnership would come in uh, between uh, industry and the uh, the educational institutions so the strengthening of um job no uh, embedded um uh training no especially in courses uh so uh the deficit now no is in a high state no? uh because of uh, uh, really uh, responding no to the call of uh, the stakeholders no our vice president uh really is um very um hands on no? um because uh, teachers claim more that they do not have time to do quality teaching because of administrative and non teaching job so what the president um, vice president ordered relieve teachers with non teaching and academic we will hire more uh, administrative staff so uh, that is um welcome uh, developments to all the deaf ed teachers and um, so we are looking forward that uh, really um that could uh, produce um good results so um i think our brig brigada escuela program no is a champion when it comes to partnership no so uh every time school opening starts um, there is this volunteerism no among um parents um private public and all those two volunteer to give something money resources time labor no to help uh, making the school conducive for learning no they, they donate paints and uh, money so uh so it makes the school really uh, and the community have a closer relationship no? because in the first place no? the school exists for the community no? and also um other than the brigada escuela we have also the school based management no? that is uh, practice to for, to hone the expertise of our educational leaders no? and then um because uh we have different standards now no full implementation uh so philippine professional standards for teachers philippine professional standards for school heads philippine professional standards for supervisors so everyone is so on their toes now to really um demonstrate the indicators no reflected in those standards and so it, it would it could uh, uh, it creates some tension and some stress to teachers because no, they will be evaluated in those indicators. However, no, there are um, surrounding no, factors that would prevent them to perform uh, optimum in their maximum level. So, so it's a bottleneck. No? It's a tug of war between uh, quality performance and accountability you know, and those um, different uh, evaluation monitoring uh, tools. No? Um, the NAYAP, our National Educators Academy of the Philippines, uh, is producing uh, what we call this career progression uh, for teachers to help them uh, move, you know, progress from one career stage to another. You know? Um, by the way, this PPST, you no, know, um, is divided. The teacher, the teachers in the public school are categorized into four levels. You no, know, the the beginning, the proficient, and uh, um, highly proficient and uh, distinguished. You no, know? so some teachers are misplaced. So uh, we will identify their competencies, and then um. DepEd will develop um, professional development no, program for them to really align their uh, competencies based on the, some assessment following the uh, indicators of... Um... So it's very exciting now, no? the Department of Education, of course, um, uh, because of trifocal no? uh, education, the Commission of Higher Education and the... Um, um, TESDA, no, or the Technical and Skills Development Authority, no. So these three really um, sit down together, no, to really uh, thresh up with the uh, uh, problems. And uh, our politicians, no, uh, they commissioned uh, a second congressional commission on education, and they published 
a book no they call it miseducation the failed system of philippine education so uh, they um, presented uh, really um uh, challenging um data no and they found out of the fragmented early childhood uh, care uh, and development uh, disjointed teacher development um lack of monitoring and then of course um inequity no in the budget um especially with regard special education fund uh, big uh, cities uh have bigger special education fund no which they uh, they can use for capacity building and um research for their teachers so at times no the interagency um partnership collaboration among national government agencies also uh, pose a challenge because of so many programs and projects which they cannot focus but um we are happy that uh, when it comes to ESD the department of agriculture and the department of environment no and natural resources no, really uh, had um, closed um collaboration uh, with um, DepEd and they are uh, sponsoring or launching uh, competitions na? who's the best uh, implementer na, of ESD programs. Uh, um, and so now um, with the extensive um, institutionalization of uh, the laws there, uh, so um it's good that uh it produced results na? internationally the esd implementation has been recognized uh, uh by simio jasper na? Uh, lately uh, japan na? simio um japan um uh, for their uh, in 2018 na? so i think um there are uh uh, we are just lucky that different, I think, uh, similar to other countries, no, the um, USA, the Australia aid, <laughs> and uh, various national embassies, no, Spain, New Zealand, are really helping now with the debt ed, no, and of course the Asian Development Bank, the, the Philippine Business for Education, and even private, no, um, telephone companies and. Um, famous uh what do you call this um restaurants and all those so um i guess you not know, somehow when the the new secretary sits in and uh, uh gaining popular with since vice president herself so uh we are just glad that uh, somehow no? <laughs> uh with her position no? as secretary of education somehow produces good results and uh, uh, we are just glad that it will really um, manifest in uh, pupil performance no? and, uh, of course, uh, teacher quality. Okay, so I think... Um, yeah. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Dom. I think that's plenty. I mean, um, you mentioned, like, really big challenges that, that exist, and it's really inspiring to see that despite all of that, there was the realiz realization that something needed to be done and the interventions that are being done in the Philippines are, are pretty revolutionary. And that then justifies why, you know, international supporters and the private sector would come in to provide uh, funding resources and, and other resources that are needed. Thank you for that sharing. I'd like to turn the question uh, to Thailand. Uh, same question, Dr. Fuang Arun. Um, what are the biggest challenges in transforming education in Thailand? And what role do you see partnerships playing? Okay, thank you. I try to uh, present within five minutes at Dr. Karen Asai. Okay, uh, I think for the biggest challenge uh, in Thailand, in my view, is the teacher competency. Uh, in this picture, you will see that in Thailand, we have more than 700, 700 uh, thousand teachers and 11 million students all the country is a huge number 
So for the student, I think uh, like other country that student have a heavy load, have to act, follow the, the policy uh, multi-level, from the national level, for the uh, ministry level, for the school level. It's just a really, uh, they work really hard. So uh, I think it's the competency of teacher is uh, is will deliver the the uh, ESD competency to the student. If you see key competency for sustainability is from UNESCO, uh, there are eight key competency of uh, learning outcome of the student. And on the right is the ESD teacher competency. Uh, in Thailand, uh, but uh, we have, uh, I will give an example of two, two projects that is uh, give a knowledge about ESD to the student and to teacher and to the director. Uh, in Thailand, we call the principal director. Not, not we not call the principal, we call director. Uh, the, the program for the, the teacher and student called OBEC Young Leaders for SDGs is organized by the Bureau of Educational Innovation Development, Ministry of Education. Uh, it's launched, I think it's around, around uh, five uh, four, or three or uh, four years ago. Uh, there are, the, there are uh, 500 teachers have, start, uh, have uh, joined this project and around only uh, 1,000 students that have uh, joined this project. But another project is uh, called Innovative Leaders for SDG, just launched last year, uh, organized by the Bureau of Educational Innovation Development Tool. Uh, uh, from, uh, from last year to now, uh, not, uh, not uh, many uh, director that uh, join this program because it just start and we hope that uh, uh, the, the project will go in uh, go on and not only from the Ministry of Education that from my faculty that I work for faculty of education Jolalagon University we touch a uh, ESD subject more than 10 years and our undergraduate and graduate students have to register in the ESD uh, course. Uh, from, from that time to this time, I think uh, more than uh, 15,000 graduate, uh, graduate uh, uh, have studied in ESD course. And most of them now are the teacher all over the country. And also uh, not, not only the teacher, now there are some of them are director of the school and some own the uh, private school and some of our student is the uh, neighbor countries such as Cambodia and uh, even from China they learned uh, ESD uh, in our faculty and um, I think it's a uh, teacher competency is uh, really important. But uh, because of if we would like our students uh, have see the importance of the ESD, they uh, we can say that we the student have should have a student engagement. They love to to study ESD. Um, teacher not uh, cannot uh, give a lecture to the student only. They give only some knowledge, but they have to like uh, 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 learn how to design lesson, like a uh, funny teaching, not uh, boring. So students love to to learn and uh, open mind to to learn a new knowledge, especially about the uh, ESD or SDG. And uh, for the uh, training course, and for my course, the the. Uh, student or uh, the teacher will know how to use uh, active learning to teach in the school, how to do a project with the community. And uh, now I think uh, everyone talk about the partnership. The partnership is very important. Uh, in the 
uh, for the Ministry of Education project and even uh, ESD cost in the Faculty of Education, we have a partnership. We have uh, like a, a knowledge uh, knowledge uh, sharing with the community, knowledge sharing with uh, the Farland universe, uh, University. Just now we have a project with the Toku University from Japan and we have uh, the the knowledge sharing with the Xinhua Uni University in China. Okay, that's uh, my answer for, for this question. Okay. Dr. Fong Arun, the programs that you're running for teacher capacity building, are they um, mainly for pre-service teachers or, or are they also for in-service teachers? Uh, both for pre-service and in-service teacher. Okay. Because in the faculty, we have a uh, undergraduate student and graduate student. So graduate student most of them are uh, uh, a teacher in the school and our director. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think uh, this this what what Dr. Fong Arun just said uh, links very nicely to my next question to Dr. Subarna actually. Um, and Dr. Subarna, um, my my next question to you is. Um, you are not part of this national ESD coalition to ensure educational transformation through ESD um, in Malaysia. And you are also working on a pilot intervention to bring ESD into schools through teacher training. Um, how do you see this intervention making an impact? And, and also, how will this impact be measured? Thanks, Karen. Um, so yes, uh, we are working with with SDSN Malaysia. In fact, yeah, uh, we are running a pilot program called the uh, UN SDSN Asia ESD Teacher Professional Development Program, and I understand that this is going to be the first of its kind uh, in the country. The aim of the program is actually to capacity build teachers uh, and school leaders uh, to advocate for greater integration of sustainability, education for sustainability, climate change education within the existing uh, education ecosystem. So um, the idea basically is simple. We want to give teachers an opportunity uh, to undergo training, uh, training that you know uh, Ministry of Education may not necessarily be able to, to conduct at large scale. So we are running this pilot um, you know, and we are experimenting to see if this would would work and if this could be scaled, you know, beyond the pilot school programs that uh, uh, we have currently in, uh, I think we have it in several states, yeah. Karen, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it's in Slango, Negri Sembilan, Kelantan, uh, Putrajaya, some of the locations of the schools. So uh, what do we want to get out of this uh, training program basically is to, get our teachers uh, to be more accustomed about what sustainability is, what sustainability education is, and, and gain greater understanding about this. Because if, if, if you remember, I mentioned earlier, 2027, the curriculum uh, review is happening now. And if we are going to see greater integration of SDGs and sustainability within the new curriculum that's coming up, we need to capacity build our teachers. Yeah, um, so hoping, fingers crossed, that this program will enable us to do this. Uh, but my uh, my uh, ultimate uh, dream would be for us to see this scaled at, you know, um, uh, nationally, all right? I want to see this being implemented uh, more systemically within the curriculum and within the training programs that the ministry has for, for teachers. So this is a good first step uh, and hopefully uh, with proper uh, funding, uh, with proper, uh, what do you call, uh, planning, with proper monitoring of the um, pilot program, we can see some positive results coming out and that would give us a good case to scale this program um, across the whole country. Um, so, Kudos to SDSN uh, Malaysia for doing this. Um, kudos to Ministry of Education for, you know, looking at this as something very, very important uh, for teachers uh, and for school leaders. Um, so you asked about how we're going to monitor this uh, and what are we going to do after that, right, Karen? So in terms of monitoring, so we have five modules. 
Um, I will not go through the module details now. We don't have time. But essentially, what we are trying to do is we are trying to get our teachers to become more sustainability literate. We want to give them, you know, knowledge, skills, values uh, that they can embed in their own classrooms with their students. Um, um, allocate time for this within their classrooms uh, and not look at this as something solely uh, for teachers in science or teachers in geography or teachers uh, only a, uh, a teaching biology to do, but we want teachers teaching all subject matters to bring this up in the classroom. And this is what our teachers lack at the moment. They don't have this capacity for interdisciplinary uh, teaching uh, and interdisciplinary learning. So we are beginning to understand this. We've already run you know, the, the first module in a uh, one of the schools already, and we've been seeing some very interesting, uh, you know, uh, results coming out. Of course, it's just the first module, uh, four more to go, but it's really interesting to see how the teachers have been engaging with the content and engaging with the uh, with the approach that we have taken uh, uh, to this program. So it's very, like I said, it's interdisciplinary. Uh, we want teachers teaching all different subjects to come together to discuss sustainability issues. Uh, we want them to figure out um, uh, solutions to how they can make this more interesting in their own classrooms. Uh, we are looking also at reflection as a key component of these programs because as teachers, it's really important for us to be reflective. Um, so we are embedding this into the program structure as well. Reflection is something teachers may not have the time to do. So we want to ensure that we put this into the program and make this something that they, uh, that they embed. And we want them to then infect other teachers in their schools. So with pilot programs like this, you maybe have 30, 40, 50 teachers only available. We want them to then we want to scale this. We want the teachers who are uh, being trained currently to train other teachers who may not have had the opportunity to also uh, be part of this. So that's what I mean by infecting, uh, infecting in a in a nice positive, uh, nice positive uh, way. Um, so you know these programs that we do. Um, I think we have to move out of uh, doing programs like this in silo. So. In the example of this SDSN um, Malaysia program, we are working together with Ministry of Education. SDSN is leading this. We have universities on board. So this is a good example of partnerships um, to accelerate SDG4, to accelerate uh, 4.7, yeah? So uh, that's a little I can talk about the, the pilot program, Karen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Doctor. A, a question just came in the chat from Sabrina, which is related, and she, Sabrina wants to know if you think that pre-service and novice teachers should be exposed to ESD more, and are there any programs that also enforce ESD in Malaysia, to your knowledge? Sure. So I assume that question is for me, yeah? It is for okay. you, yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes, a great question, Sabrina. Do I think pre-service and novice teachers should be exposed to it more definitely. So I'm from the School of Education at the University of Nottingham. So I'm going to speak uh, about this from the perspective of from my experiences. So we offer Bachelor of Education programs uh, with an emphasis on TESOL. So when I joined the school in 2022 May, I told everyone in the school, teachers, I mean, our colleagues, my, my colleagues, my students and all, uh, the importance of understanding what being a teacher is and what being a teacher in the future is going to be like. Yeah, uh, the the workforce, the teaching workforce of the future is going to be very very different. Um, it's not like what it's today. Okay, teachers of the future need to be equipped with knowledge about what's happening to the planet. Teachers need to know how to engage with learners and give them these literacies to understand how the workforce of the future is going to be, how the planet of the future is going to be. Because we know increasingly climate change is causing lots of disaster and education is impacted because of this. So as teachers, we definitely want, um, you know, we, we definitely need our teachers to be able to understand this and also 
um, get their students uh, to understand this. So definitely free service. That's what we're doing at University of Nottingham. We are embedding the SDGs. We are embedding uh, sustainability within uh, the curriculum. Novice teachers definitely should be exposed to it. And programs like uh, what SDSN is, uh, SDSN Malaysia is working on is definitely uh, helpful. We definitely want to see more such programs happening uh, in the future. I think also just to quickly add, you know, once this pilot is done, we also want to see how it can be extended to the, the public um, teacher development institutions. Um, right now, the the urgent need is seen in for in-service teachers because they are already, you know, uh, teaching in, in classrooms. They're already uh, having face time with students. So that was the urgent urgency but it will definitely be extended also to the pre-service teachers at some point. Thank you for that, Dr. Subarna. Um, Dr. Dom, a question for you. Um, there are many successful ESD projects that have already been tried and tested in the Philippines um, that I think other countries could can learn from and perhaps emulate. Could you tell us about a couple of them? Um, I'm I'm conscious that we only have six minutes left in this webinar, so I would I would have to ask all speakers to keep your comments brief, please. Over to you, Dr. Dom. Uh, okay, thank you. So um I just mentioned three which are uh, really uh we have uh, created um great impact, uh, not only to the academics but also health no? and uh, social consciousness. So the first one here is the school inside the garden. So um as far as uh, 1995 no the the launch of this uh and it being uh, continued until now no and uh, so um basically uh, students would uh, make this their garden as laboratory for learning no they learn about science no um they learn about mathematics language no and of course integration of the different concepts um they from here once they produce a product, okay, they can sell it. So entrepreneurial and financial skills no, will be developed apart from learning the, the basic uh, content in um, the discipline. Okay, and of course, um, uh, consciousness really between um, the, the parents no? uh, when they come to the school they they see clean and green no? wow they'll be amazed now with the, the 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 flowers and the blossoming no? green leaves and the trees so the school in a garden and uh, it's really um, sustainable then another one is gulayan sa paralan so this is uh, close with the uh, uh, school in a garden, but it is more of really uh, for um, producing vegetables intended for a school feeding program. No? Uh, we have uh, malnourished children, those who have um, experiencing health uh, problems, so they don't need to buy, but they can just um, harvest no, from their school gardens. And um, of course, as laboratory for um, children as well. And then the the third one is the mainstreaming no, of disaster risk reduction management, uh, and of course, um, climate change. You know? So, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, development no, of uh, modules, no, um, uh, integrating no, these concepts, of course. Um, Philippines, no, there we, we are visited by typhoons, no, more than 20 a year, and then earthquakes and all those, uh, all the natural calamities are, are with us. So uh, in order to survive no, and equip our young learners, so we have developed a manual no, for them on what to do um, uh, before, during, and after such disasters. No? And... Um, our partners, like the Department of Agriculture, in Environment and Natural Resources, no? so they conduct uh, sustainable and eco-friendly initiatives no? and competitions. And um, they give a uh, uh, handsome uh, amount no? as prize to really recognize and uh, motivate other 
institutions no to really uh, implement uh, pub, uh this uh, gardening na no? gulayan and the siga and the uh, So capacity building of teachers as well. So the the OST and of course um uh collaboration with uh universities. So I think um that's all about our three uh notable Thank projects. You. Thanks. Those are great mm -hmm. projects that you shared. Mm -hmm. Um I'd like to ask the next question to Dr. Fuang Arun. Um You have been working on ESD in Thailand for a substantial amount of time and you have seen its evolution. What would you say are the key success factors of driving ESD in Thailand? Okay, thank you. But I cannot say that it's success or it's the best. But I, uh, in my opinion, is for the factor that uh, for driving ESD in Thailand toward network and partnership, And for the network that, uh, such as I work with the Ministry of Education, one who launched the uh, ESD teacher training is my former student. When she graduates master's degree in the faculty of education and go back to work at the Ministry of Education, so she realized that uh, SDG or ESD is very important. So she launched this project and we work together some uh, sometime I give a uh, deliver uh, a lecture for for her project and for the partnership uh, because I work in the higher education level so uh, most of my higher education project with other university in Thailand and in the foreign country so I think uh, uh, even the further network or the partnership is really uh, are very important to drive uh, ESD in in the um, the school level, university level, in country level, uh, nation, na nation level, or in national level. Okay, that's my question. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost at the end of this webinar. Um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the chat uh, box where there is a link for you to fill out an evaluation form. And if any of you requires a certificate of participation, fill out that form and um, there is also a link there to request for a certificate. Uh, before we close, I would just like to turn back to uh, my three very esteemed panelists um, and, and ask you to, to leave us with one final key message um, following this session today, there was so much that was shared, but if there was one final key message you would like to leave, what is that message? Dr. Subarna, can we start with you? Okay, sure. Uh, I I was hoping, you know, uh, I could talk about the national study findings, but it's okay. Uh, I think the one key message that I want to leave everyone with today is ESD is something, it, it's not a one size fits all uh, concept, yeah? The realities on the ground are very different. Um, we often tend to bring a very Western lens to uh, running ESD at the local level. And when that happens, it becomes very confusing. Uh, students, teachers are all unable to relate because what's happening in, in, in our country may be very different from what's happening in the UK, Australia, US, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's important for us Um, as educators uh, and as stakeholders within this system to uh, be able to localize um, ESD so that it becomes relevant and uh, relatable uh, to our learners and also to um, our teachers. And I think we also shouldn't just be focusing on curriculum aspects, but we should also be looking at co-curricular aspects so that it's looked at uh, in a very, very comprehensive manner. Uh, and last but not least, I think education must empower teachers and learners. Um, if there's one thing that, you know, I have um, observed, you know, I have friends who are teachers in public school systems. Um, if there's one thing that they often struggle with is that uh, they feel that they are not empowered enough. So I think empowerment is really important if we want to move the ESD agenda forward. And one final thought is that we have to move towards becoming more interdisciplinary in our approach to teaching. 
Um, and I think uh, ESD is a right uh, approach to introduce in schools, uh, given the the you know the directions that we are seeing uh, within within Malaysia and also uh, at a global level. So I think uh, that is all I want to say. Thank you very much uh, for the Thank opportunity, you. and I hope we can actually come together. Uh, you know, at another time to see how we can actually drive our SDSN pilot program, scale it across, uh, you know, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, and also Thailand with the help of all our speakers today. Thank you, Dr. Subarna. Uh, I'd like to turn to the other lady, Dr. Dum, if you don't mind. Uh, Dr. Fuang Arun, uh, you go first with your final thoughts. Okay, thank you. I think it's... Uh, uh, the as I mentioned before, the partnership and work network drives sustainability forward. And how? I think it's uh, by use, uh, by uniting the diverse stakeholders, such as government, NGO, academia, business, community. Everyone can can drive the ESD because it's uh, our benefit, our world benefits. And we can cultivate the knowledge, skill, and value needed to create more resilient and equitable future for our world. So I, I think I see uh, the my former student that I mentioned before, Ms. Napas, uh, Napason, maybe uh, the, the next uh, the next uh, event, maybe you can uh, invite her to talk about her project in the Ministry of Education. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We certainly will do. Dr. Dong, over to you for the final point. Oh, yes. No, um, transforming education or learning uh, or including ESD, of course, is a shared responsibility. So uh, there is no specific sector no, that, that would just address no, uh, that. Um, okay, so we need to pull our hands, our heads, our pockets together no, um, for the the love of mother nature now we only have one earth no? and um, so uh, in all things we do integration no contextualization of our curriculum so as uh, teachers that is our weapon no curriculum uh, and of course um, we should not be drowned by technology no we should still go back to um, environment our ecosystem no? let our students uh, feel no, the problems, the real authentic problems, not just sitting pretty and Google no, in the, in the, uh, the, the fingertips what the problems are, but bring them to real authentic problems. So, and that um, they have to inculcate um, ecological, environmental, and sustainability literacy. That's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a productive, uh, very fruitful, um, full of content discussion indeed this morning. We've learned so much about the unique situations in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines and Thailand, but also the commonalities that we have. I think there is um, a lot of material that would help us prepare for the next webinar in this series. So please stay tuned to this space and join us again as we explore transformative education through ESD further in subsequent webinars. Thank you all so much for joining us. The link is in the chat box for those of you who have not filled out the evaluation. Um, and I've also just put in a link to mission4.7.org where you can find out more about the work that we're doing to advance SDG 4, target number 7 particularly, which is Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship. Thank you, everyone. Join us again next time. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Bye-bye. Hope to see you. Thank you. Should we take a Yep. Wait. Can I have everyone's camera open? would like to capture this no, moment. All right. I think yeah, some of you has an up on the camera. All right. Are we ready? Please um yeah, keep your best smile at in three, two, one. 
All right. Next slide. Three, two, one. I'm still, we still have few more, Kevin. Three, two, one. All right, the last page. Three, two, one. All right, Karen, it's all good. I get it back to you, Karen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Friday and a good weekend.